Chapter 11. Lizar. The house on Careworn Street stood empty. Its doors and windows boarded up and an imperial crest stenciled onto the planks in whitewash. The occupant had been a lifelong Mooresvale resident, a clockmaker to trade who also dabbled in antiquities, an expensive hobby requiring more funds than his vocation could provide. Exceptional initiatives, however, had been more than happy to indulge his interests for the past two decades, in return for certain services. The best cover, the Zan recalled, from a lecture at the division training school, is no cover at all. It is always preferable to recruit from amongst the local populace. An agent with fewer lies to tell has fewer lies to forget should they ever face detection. She paused at a dressmaker's shop opposite the house, ostensibly to gaze longingly at the elegant gown adorning the mannequin in the window, such a contrast to her own dowdy skirt and jacket of plain wool. However, her eyes strayed constantly to the clockmaker's house reflected in the glass. She could see no obvious signs of surveillance in the houses standing on either side, nor any indication in the street itself, but the cadre were rarely obvious about anything. The clockmaker had been silent for close to seven weeks. It was improbable they would have kept watch for nearly two months following his arrest, but certainly not impossible. Lizanne had once spent the best part of three months secluded in a hide near an East Mandanorian hunting lodge before her target appeared. The clockmaker, she knew, was almost certainly dead. He may have had fewer lies to remember than a division agent, but would have also had little resistance to the cadre's highly effective if unsubtle, interrogation methods. She had been briefed on his activities, and knew there was nothing he could have told them that might identify her. As soon as the man failed to make his regular rendezvous, his handler followed protocol and made for his extraction point. The fact that there had been no Imperial agents waiting for him indicated the arrest must have been very recent, probably a matter of hours. Regardless of this good fortune, Lizanne knew that the clockmaker would have provided his interrogators with a fulsome account of his activities, including the recent purchase of an empty box with an interesting inscription. A box purchased at his handler's insistence, no less. Unsubtle they may be, but the cadre were rarely foolish. They have to know Division will have sent someone, she concluded. They would watch this place for a year, just on the off chance of snaring me. Lizanne decided it best to leave a close inspection for another time, casting a final, wistful glance at the gown in the window before moving on. She had a call to make, and it would be best not to make it afternoon. Can you sew? Housekeeper Miram asked her. She was a plump woman, with severely tied back hair of jet black and disproportionately small eyes, resembling dark beads set into the fleshy pillow of her face. They almost seemed to disappear completely as she looked Lizanne up and down, gaze narrowed in estimation. Yes, ma'am, Lizanne replied, eyes downcast. Corventine servants ready looked their employers in the eye. Show me your hands. Lizanne tentatively raised her hands, the housekeeper grabbing her wrists and turning them over. Used to work, I see, she observed. But the calluses have gotten a little soft, my dear. Out of practice, are we? The voyage from Corvus was long, ma'am. Not many folk in steerage willing to pay for tailoring or cleaning. Did earn a few pins cooking, though. Had to fix her own meals on the ship. All right. Mira raised her hands and moved back to her desk. She wore a heavy set of keys on a chain about her neck. Keys that rattled as she moved. Lizanne hoped she wore it throughout the day and into the evening. Had you employed in the household of Landgrave Echion von Morgesol for two years, Miram said, scanning the letters of introduction Lizanne had provided. Yes, ma'am. I was, ma'am. Second maid to Landgravine Morgesol. Yes. The housekeeper peered closer at the letters. Who has done you the kindness of signing these references, I see. The Landgravine was always very pleased with my service, ma'am. I assume you came here in the knowledge that there is a long-standing friendship between the Landgrave and my employer. 
My former housekeeper's suggestion, ma'am. She said, His honour often received letters from Fur Grave Artony, complaining of the lack of decent servants to be found in Moorsvale. True enough, Miriam sighed. The last girl kept tripping up the stairs with the master's tea tray. I suspect there may be something in the water here, a bacterium of some kind that stunts the wits of those born to this blighted land. Housekeeper Miriam sat down, clasping her hands together and fixing the Zan with a hard stare. Now, girl, if you expect to find a place here, I will have the truth from you. Why did you leave the land Grey's employ? I find it scarcely credible a maid of such experience and such a fortunate situation would simply pack her things and travel across the ocean on a whim. This one's a mite too sharp for my liking, the Zan decided. She summoned a flush to her cheeks and lowered her gaze farther, shifting in discomfort. There was a difficulty in the Landgrave's household. Speak plainly, girl, Miram snapped. What difficulty? Lizanne kept her gaze averted. The Landgrave's youngest son, he developed an inappropriate interest in one far below his station. Ah! Miram sat back, grimacing slightly in understanding. And was this interest returned? Gracious no, ma'am. Nizan looked up with an earnest gaze. He was just a boy, with boyish notions. I tried to be polite in dissuading his attentions, but his interest became unduly excessive, to the point where it threatened embarrassment to the family. She was careful to put the correct inflection on the term embarrassment, a term that carried great significance in the upper echelons of Corventine society. Amongst the managerial class of the corporate world, steeped in its own modes of snobbery and petty gossip, social embarrassment would always be overlooked in light of success. In the Empire, however, it could be a family's ruin, especially if word of it reached the Imperial Court. So, the Land Gravine thought it best you were placed at far remove, Miram said. Yes, ma'am. She was very kind. You will be free of such entanglements in this household. The Burgrave has but one child, a daughter of fifteen. Unfortunately for you, she is in need of a maid. I give you fair warning, she is a difficult charge. Hence, the vacancy. Housekeeper Miram opened a drawer and consigned Lizanne's letters to it with a brisk sweep of her plump arm. I shall, of course, need to verify your references. It should take the better part of eight weeks to exchange correspondence with your former employers. In the interim, you will receive room and board and two crowns a month, rising to three upon confirmation of your status. Is this acceptable? Lazanne gave an eager nod. Her research had indicated most servants in Corvus could expect to receive half a crown a month. It appeared servants were indeed hard to come by in Moorsvale. Very acceptable, ma'am. After leading her to the small attic room she would occupy during her service, Miram had given her a maid's uniform of somewhat archaic appearance, and referred her to the extensive list of duties pinned to the door. I have an absolute intolerance for tardiness, she said. You are required to be at your allotted task by the fifth hour, not one second later. As for now, get changed and report to the kitchen. You can take the master his afternoon tea. Burgrave, the honest Akiv Artonin, was a wiry man of perhaps sixty, who greeted Lazan with a kindly smile as she curtsied before his desk, tea tray in hand. A new face, the Burgrave said, rising from his chair. Lazan took the opportunity to steal a glance at his desk as she lowered her gaze, finding it mostly covered in household accounts and frustratingly free of any maps or intriguing antique-related correspondence. And who might you be, my dear? Krista, sir, she curtsied again. Recently arrived from Corvus and employed by Madame Mira on recommendation of Landgrave Morgosal. Oh, excellent! Arturin's smile broadened. And how is my old friend? I'm afraid I have sadly neglected our correspondences of late. The Landgrave has been unwell, as you may know, sir. 
but his condition has improved in recent months. All true facts gleaned from division reports on the Corventine aristocracy. Landgrave Morgesol, an enthusiastic whore chaser, had been laid low by an infection of an intimate nature, recently cured thanks to advances in medicinal green. I am glad, Arturin said. The Landgrave and I served in the cavalry together for several years. It would pain me to think a mundane illness could do what a rebel cannon could not. The Landgrave often spoke of your service, sir. He said you saved his life at the Battle of Verosa. Another well-documented truth. Despite his less than imposing physical presence, in his youth, Captain Arkiv Artunin's courage in rescuing his wounded commanding officer from the teeth of a rebel battery had won him the Emperor's star for bravery and elevation to the nobility. A dimly recalled day, he said, smile fading a little, and best forgotten in any case. He paused for a moment, scrutinizing her face. You are from Corvus, you say? Her complexion was too pale for a Corvus native. The Burgrave was an observant man, it seemed. I was born in the city, sir, but my people were of northern stock. Ah, yes. The famines drove a great many of your people into the heartland, as I recall. Tell me, do you speak Selburin? Yes, sir. My grandmother never spoke anything else, so I just picked up on it. Excellent. Can you read it, too? This was tricky. She couldn't appear overly educated, but suspected Artony had a particular reason for his question, one that might prove useful. After a fashion, sir, grandmother had a box of old letters. When her eyes got bad, she needed someone to read them to her. It seems good fortune has brought you to my door. Artony went to the heavily laden bookcase behind his desk, scanning the shelves until he extracted the required volume. Lazanne noted how he ignored the upper shelf completely. The row of thick legal reference works it held were free of dust, but appeared mostly unread from the clarity of the lettering and intactness of the bindings. Here we are, he said. Lazanne, lowering her gaze once more, as he turned to her with a slender tome in hand. What do you make of this? he asked, handing it to her. She set the tea tray down on his desk and accepted the book. It was bound in red leather, and the gold mostly faded from the embossed title. Vizian's Fables, she read, taking care to labour over the pronunciation. It was a collection of children's stories from the early empire, long before the Silvurin language had been displaced by Varsal. Grandmother would tell me these tales, she said, smiling in fond recollection. But I never saw them in the book before. She began to hand the book to him, but he shook his head. Why don't you keep hold of it for a little while? I've attempted my own translation, but my Serburin is hardly not up to the task. I keep losing the nuance. With your assistance, perhaps I can capture it. You want me to write all of these stories out in Varsal, sir? Oh, I think a verbal recitation will do. Naturally, you will be paid for the additional duty. He smiled again, and she found herself hoping she wouldn't have to kill him. Thank you, sir. I would be very happy to help. A series of loud thumps came from beyond the study door, as someone descended the stairs with considerable haste. Lizanne saw a wince of anticipation pass across the Burgrave's face, an instant before the door flew open, and a diminutive figure in a blue silk dress burst in. The killer, Artanin said warmly. Moving towards a new entrant, arms opening to embrace her. The girl, however, didn't seem interested in the welcoming hug. Who's she? she demanded, pointing a rigid finger at Lizanne. This is Krista, your new maid. Lizanne gave a curtsy of the appropriate depth. A pleasure, miss. The girl would have been pretty, but for the scowl that transformed her features into a mask of unwelcoming spite. Get rid of her! she said, turning back to her father. I didn't choose her. You said I could choose my maid. You chose the last one, my darling, Artonin reminded her in a gentle tone. And she left after two days. She was a thief and a liar and a strumpet, the girl shot another scowling glance at his aunt. 
and so's this one. I can tell. Perhaps she shares her father's keen eye, the Zan considered, albeit slightly peeved at the strumpet remark. She saw the Burgrave stiffen, his patience evidently running thin. Do you wish me to force you to apologize to a servant, Tequila? He asked in a soft voice. The girl's scowl deepened into a defiant glare as she matched stares with her father, eventually softening into a sullen pout when it became clear this was a battle she couldn't win. Sorry, she mumbled in Lazan's direction, not meeting her gaze. There we are, Artonine said, smiling once more as he placed a hand on his daughter's cheek. Did you find an appropriate dress today? No, she huffed. They were all awful. If only you would let me go to near this. Their prices are ridiculous. Your mother always said so. The girl's scowl returned, accompanied by a self-pitying whine. Mother wouldn't have sent me to the ball in little more than peasant rags. Keep looking. I'm sure you'll find something. Krista will go with you tomorrow. Tequila gave another glance in his aunt's direction, a frown of suspicion augmenting her grieved pout. What could she know about fashion? I did see a most fine dress this morning, Lizanne offered, in a shop window on Carewan Street. I believe it would suit Miss Arthur very well indeed. Marvellous, the Burgrave said, stilling his daughter's next objection with a tight hug and a kiss to the forehead. Now, off to the drawing room, my dear. Miss Margaret will be here soon for your piano lesson. The girl shrugged free of him and stomped to the door. Nazan, hearing the words, Margarita tone-deaf hug, before the door closed behind her. I've survived revolution, war, and over a decade on this continent, the Burgrave reflected. But, by all the ghosts of the Hundred Empress, I think fatherhood will finally do me in. As was custom, Corventine servants ate together in the kitchen, two hours after serving their master's evening meal. In addition to housekeeper Mira, the grave Artinin maintained a staff of three maids, one footman, one cook, and one butler. In most noble houses, the butler would have exercised authority below stairs, but here everyone deferred to Mira, mainly, Lizanne assumed, due to the obvious infirmity and wayward memory of the ancient White-haired fellow, seated at the head of the table. What is your name, girl? He inquired of Lizanne for the third time, as the cook doled out a dessert of rice pudding. Krista, Mr. Derelich, she replied, earning a nod of approval from Miriam for the absence of impatience in her tone. Got a look of the north about you, he observed, as he had once before. Best if you don't go wandering too far. Not everyone in Corvus is as welcoming as the Artonin family. Lizanne saw the two maids seated opposite her, smother a shared giggle. They were several years her junior, and prone to girlish ways, though they both had the sturdy look of those who grew up accustomed to daily labour. I shall be careful, sir, Lizanne assured him. May I ask, Miss Krista, the footman said, what manner of vessel carried you from Corvus? She was called... The southern pride, the Zan replied. Biggest boat I ever saw until I caught sight of that warship steaming into the harbour ahead of us. Oh yes, the regal, the footman enthused. A fine sight she makes. Such clean lines. They say she can achieve close to thirty knots. Or maybe more, the Zan thought, recalling the sight of the great steel fan affixed to the regal's hull. You have a liking for ships, Mr. Regan. Indeed I do. It is my ambition to enlist in the Navy, once the Burgrave sees fit to sign my letter of recommendation. Lizanne could see the keenness in Regan's expression. She put his age at just over twenty, and his face had a certain plumpish aspect not dissimilar to housekeeper Miram's. His small, dark eyes confirmed Lizanne's suspicion of a maternal relationship, as did Miram's frown of disapproval at his maritime ambitions. I was lucky in catching sight of a famous personage disembarking the regal, Lizanne went on. Grand Marshal Moradin, no less. 
A sudden hush descended as Drelich stiffened, his spoon falling from his hands, and all confusion diverting his gaze. You are at him, he whispered. The butcher is here? Don't upset yourself, Mr. Drelich, Miram said in a cautious tone. Twelve thousand men dead in a day, Drelich went on, voice edged with a long-held anger. My son amongst them, all on the butcher's order. I'm sorry if I... The Zan began, then fell silent at Miram's warning glare. And they call him a hero, Drelich said, teeth clenched now. The great commander, no more than a pig, grown fat of the blood of wasted youth. Now, now, Miram said with a strange smile, getting to her feet and laying a firm hand or the old man's shoulder. Our new employee might mistake your meaning, Mr. Derich, and we all know where mistaken words can lead. I think you're overly tired. Perhaps a lady knight will do you good. Oh, it's ill that is here, Derelich muttered as Miram ushered him to his feet, guiding him to the stairs. Means the Emperor has another slaughter in mind. Best if you send your boy away. Please don't say such things, Mr. Derelich. Lizanne heard Miram say as their footsteps ascended the back stairs. Well, that's the most sense I've heard out of him since I got here, one of the maids said. She was the tall of the two, with a freckled nose and auburn curls escaping the pale blue cap the maids were required to wear. Careful, Regan warned. The gatherer might forgive a half-mad old man's ramblings, but you don't have that excuse. The maid scrunched her nose at him in dismissal, before turning her attention to Lizanne. I'm Kala, she said, then nodded at the girl next to her. She's Misha. The other girl, clearly the more shy of the two, replied to Lizanne's smile with an uncertain one of her own. Unlike Kala, her colouring was more in keeping with Corvantines from the Imperial Heartland. Light olive skin and black hair, although her eyes were a pale shade of green. You have been with the family long? Lizanne asked her. Though it was Kala who replied. Five years, she said. Madame Miram picked us out of the orphanage. It was going to be just me, but Misha gave such a terrible bawling at us being separated that she took her too. She flinched as Misha gave her an annoyed poke in the ribs. Well, you did. We should thank you for turning up when you did, she went on, turning back to Lizanne. Otherwise, it'd be us waiting on the horror. The horror? Lizanne inquired. The Burgrave's evil spawn. Kala paused to stick her tongue out at Regan's sign of reproach. Tosh, you don't like her any better than the rest of us. This will be a happy house to work in but for her. Ah, Miss Tikella, Lizanne said. I'm to accompany her tomorrow. She needs a new dress. And you'd best prepare for a trying day. What saw her scream herself sick in the milliners because they didn't have a blue ribbon for her bonnet? Madame Miram did warn me she was. Difficult. Difficult's not the word. She's been a nightmare ever since her mother died. Now, there was a woman who knew the value of a good switching now and then. The bird grave's too kind is what it is. Forking out for piano lessons, dancing lessons, sketching lessons, new shoes and frocks every week. All has to be paid for. No wonder the bird grave's been selling off his old stuff. Won't be long before one of us will be let go so she can festoon herself with jewels and such. Also, she can snare a nobleman one day. Not that there's one mad enough to have her. After supper, and an hour spent scrubbing dishes at the cook's direction, Lizanne repaired to her attic room to lie on the bed. She removed her shoes, but was otherwise fully clothed while she indulged in two hours of sleep. Her insomnia would always disappear once the deployment was fully underway. An experience had taught her the value of seizing the opportunity to sleep whenever practicable. Inevitably, there would come a time when such indulgence became impossible, and she would face a constant struggle with exhaustion, though the green would help as long as it lasted. She woke in the small hours, finding the house steeped in a gratifying quietude. Rising from the bed, she filled the bowl on the bedside table and splashed water on her face to banish the lingering fog of sleep, then retrieved the spider and whisper from their hiding place in the gutter outside a small window. She went to the door and opened it a fraction. Strapping on the spider, 
and injecting a drop of green to enhance her senses. She could hear no trace of conversation, though a female voice was whimpering through a nightmare, and a loud snoring could be heard from one floor down. Mr. Drellich, she assumed, with some satisfaction. The grating cacophony would help mask any unavoidable creaking from the staircase. Lizan made an unhurried progress down the back stairs to the next floor, then across the hall to the main staircase. She had the whisper in hand, though hadn't thought it appropriate to load a red ball. Should she encounter an unfortunate nighttime wanderer, the issue would require a stealthy resolution. She had already identified a narrow, shaded alleyway two streets away where her body would most likely lie undiscovered for sufficient time to facilitate her swift extraction. She paused at the landing on the first floor, crouching and scanning the hallway below. The distressed whimpering she had detected before was louder here, and she realised it emanated from the room of the Burgrave's daughter. The sounds were mostly indistinct through the door, but the ebbing green enabled her to catch the words, Please, and I didn't tell, amidst the babble. The horror has horrors of her own, it seems, Lizan concluded, before moving on. Haste is the burglar's worst vice, she had been told at the division school. Her tutor in the larcenous arts was a compact but muscular man, she later learned, had been the most successful thief in North Mandanorian history before exceptional initiatives offered him a lucrative teaching contract. The thief who rushes towards their objective is the thief who will be hanging by a rope the next morning. So, she moved with a creeping slowness down the final flights of stairs, splaying her bare toes wide for a stable grip on the wood. There's never been a stair or floorboard that didn't creak, the former burglar had said. Secret is not to fight it, but control it. Lift your foot just as slow as you put it down. The stairs made a few protesting noises as she descended to the ground floor, but nothing that wouldn't be mistaken for the natural grunts and groans common to all older houses in the quiet hours. After a full ten minutes of careful progress, she finally felt the chill marble of the checkerboard floor under her feet. She paused, eyes roving the shadows, ears alive for anything out of place. Moving towards the Burgrave's study, only when satisfied the household slumber hadn't been interrupted. As expected, the study door was locked, almost certainly by Altonin himself. It would be a rare Corventine noble who would allow a servant unfettered access to a study, no matter how trusted. Lazan crouched, injecting another drop of green and peering at the lock. One of the former burglar's more tedious lessons had been the memorization of every major make of lock employed throughout the civilized world. This was a fairly typical example of an Aylborn commodity sure-safe mortis lock. Like many a Corventine, it appeared, Burgrave Artening was not immune to flouting the imperial restrictions on purchase of corporate goods. It was an old and uncomplicated design, but greatly disliked by the criminal fraternity for its solidity and the weight of its main lever, both of which made it extremely difficult to pick. She injected a half-second burst of black and closed her eyes, clearing her mind and focusing on the memory of the diagram depicting the lock's inner workings. The main lever was heavy, but light as a feather under the touch of the black. She remembered to hold it in place at the apex of his arc, as releasing it would result in an unwelcome rattle. Instead, the sure safe issued only a faint click as it surrendered its grip to the door. Nizan slowly worked the door handle and let herself in, closing it softly behind her. She briefly checked the desk, finding it clear of papers and the drawers, all locked. Using black to pick the locks was a possibility, but also tricky and time-consuming. In any case, she thought it unlikely Artening would conceal anything of true value or interest in so obvious a location. She quickly switched her attention to the top shelf of his bookcase and the row of thick, legal tomes. She reached up and tested the seam between two of the volumes, giving a soft grunt of satisfaction. When it transpired, the books were actually joined at the binding. In fact, these weren't books at all. A few seconds further exploration revealed twin catches at each end of the edifice, and pressing them in unison enabled its smooth removal. Any expectation that the revealed hiding place would contain a delightfully complex artifact of gears and cogs was swiftly dashed, however. Instead, there were papers. A dozen or so tightly bound bundles of letters, 
some stacked periodicals, and several leather-bound ledger books. Reading it all in the time available was impossible, and she could see no obvious clue as to which would offer useful information. Sighing, she took a moment to memorise the position of the cache's contents before reaching inside and extracting the topmost ledger book. She was expecting merely a mundane list of household expenditures, but upon leafing through the first few pages, found herself pleasantly surprised. The Burgrave wrote in flowing, elegant Etherean, interspersed with sketches and diagrams of an enticingly technical nature. Skipping back to the first page, she found herself whispering aloud the title inscribed at the top, Conjectures on the Designs and Inventions of the Mad Artisan. Although Lausanne was not habitually given to expressions of excitement, she couldn't suppress a slight increase in the tempo of her heartbeat as she read on. The true identity of this man, or one might more properly say genius, known to a brotherhood of scholars as a mad artisan, has never been fully established. What is known beyond any credible doubt is that he was born in the Empire sometime during the late Third Imperium when he arrived in the then nascent colony of Morsnail while still a young man in his twenties. It is also known that he made several journeys into the interior of this continent and that his experiences there were fundamental in crafting the many wondrous designs he left to posterity. Chief amongst these devices is, of course, the marvellous Arantian Solcraft, the exact operation of which still defies our understanding, although the inscription on the box that houses it leaves one inevitably to speculate on the artisan's knowledge regarding perhaps the greatest mystery this continent possesses. The door's hinges were well oiled, but still issued a betraying whine as it opened. Nizan's arm snapped level with her shoulder, the whisper straight and unwavering as it centred on the space between the intruder's eyes. Tekela stood in the doorway, dressed in a silk nightdress, her hand still on the door handle and staring at Lazan with wide eyes. For some reason, her cheeks were damp with fresh tears. The scowl from the afternoon had vanished now, replaced by an expression of blank incomprehension. What are you doing? She had time to say, before Lazan's finger tightened on the whisper's trigger.